Let's kick the video off with a little video game history. In 1980, Namco, a Japanese gaming company, came out with a game called Puckman. You know, because the character was shaped like a hockey puck. Due to fear that the name would kind of be defaced once it came over to Western countries, they changed it from Puckman to Pac-Man because you see before, people would probably change out the P with an F you see where I'm going with this. Apparently, they didn't have a whole lot of faith in Americans to be mature and responsible with the name, so they switched it, probably smartly. Anyway, three years later in 1983, Adam Jones was born. By this time, Pac-Man was all the craze in the US, and Adam's mom felt that the way he attacked his bottle was the same exact way Pac-Man the video game attacked those pellets. So believe it or not, that's where the Pac-Man nickname come from. It literally stuck with this man from birth all the way through his NFL career. The game would turn out to be a perfect allegory for Adam's life. A constant race to eat and attain resources with very short time spells of invincibility. But the ghost of his past never stopped chasing Adam. This is what happened to Adam Pac-Man Jones. Cue the way. Adam Bernard Jones was born September 30th, 1983 in College Park, Georgia. His upbringing, rough to say the least. When Pac-Man was around five years old, his mom was sent to prison. During that exact same time span, his father was murdered gunshot. Before Pac-Man was even six years old, he not only lost both his parents, but his uncle, another male figure in his life, was stabbed, losing his life. In addition to this, Pac-Man witnessed several of his friends also lost to violent deaths. So before you judge this cat as we go through this video, consider waiting to the end, see how the whole thing turns out, and then think about what he actually had to come from to get where he went. And if you're not impressed, then I don't know, tough crowd. Growing up in the projects of Georgia, Adam constantly stayed in trouble. By the time he was 11 or 12, he'd already gained a pretty bad reputation and parents would tell their kids stay away from that Pac-Man Jones kid. And I'm gonna be honest, man, they was right. Pac-Man admitted himself that anything you can name at that age already, he was into it. He flunked out of two junior high schools, had no interest in reading, writing, math, or anything that dealt with school at the time. Now he would openly tell people that one day he'd play in the NFL and apparently somebody finally got through to him to explain that in order to play in the NFL, you're gonna have to go to school and pass. Otherwise, you'll never get the opportunity. So with that said, Pac-Man finally gets through middle school, gets to high school, Walks in that thing on the first day, looks around, oh man, this is nice, gets into a fight. Right at the gate, suspended for the first three games of the season. Once Pac-Man finally took the field, it was worth the wait. His coach said he had a great attribute about forgetting the previous play and moving on. Obviously, a key skill for a cornerback. Another great cornerback quality he had was the ability to change direction. Dude can mirror receiver so damn well and honestly, this is always where I thought the nickname came from. Cause when you play the game of Pac-Man, you quickly realize, yo, Pac-Man don't care about physics. He just be going right at full speed and then bam, he's going left in less than a blink of an eye. So that's why I thought the nickname came from and I always thought, yo, that's such a great nickname for a cornerback. Not to mention, I think Pac-Man wore like a big revolution helmet. It might not have been a revolution helmet, but he wore like this big helmet because he had the dreads, you need something to go over it. So he even looked like Pac-Man out there running on the field. It's crazy, it's crazy how they worked out. In high school, Pac-Man played offense and defense. And during his senior year, he had 1,850 yards rushing, plus six interceptions and 120 tackles on the defensive side of the ball. Bro, that's pretty damn crazy right there. That's some that's some hell of five stats, man. He also earned All-American in track and he took his basketball team to two state championships to go alongside his two state championships in football. Pac-Man received multiple scholarship offers but decided to attend West Virginia. Unfortunately, during Pac-Man's freshman year of college, his grandma passed and the only game he missed during his entire college career was that Saturday that he had to go to his grandmother's funeral. The fact that Pac-Man lost his grandma during his freshman year in college seems pretty damn cruel if you ask me. His dad had passed, his mom had gone to prison, his uncle had passed, so his grandma steps in to raise him and then now you hit college and boom, she's gone. Still, it seemed to straighten Pac-Man out for a little bit cause 
during his college run, he didn't have a whole lot of off the field issues. He did have a few. We'll touch on one in particular. Basically, uh, he got into it with another student and ended up beating the dude up with a pool stick. <sighs> Pac-Man played three years at West Virginia. He made second team All Big East as a sophomore, then made first team All Big East the very next year. He was always explosive and incredibly dynamic in college, racking up eight interceptions in his career and averaging an extra 20 yards per interception return, which is a godsend for the offense. Not only do you get the turnover, but now you get even better field position to help you get towards your goal, which of course is the end zone. But Pac-Man contributed to field position in more ways than one. One of his greatest contributions from a field position standpoint was what he was able to do in the return game. He didn't return as a freshman, but during his sophomore and junior seasons, he averaged just under a thousand yards returning per season. And after only two years, he was ranked second on West Virginia's career kickoff return list with 1,475 yards. After his junior season, Pac-Man wisely decided to turn pro. Here's what one NFL scout had to say about him. Jones has just decent size, but he can do it all. He is a physical, quick, and fast cover corner with toughness versus the run and playmaking skills as a potential return specialist in the NFL. Jones will need to protect himself versus bigger receivers in the NFL, but much like Vikings Antoine Winfield, he is aggressive, tough, strong, and confident enough to handle size mismatches in the NFL. In our opinion, Jones is one of the elite cornerback prospects in the 2005 draft class and his versatility as a return specialist only adds to his value. If he isn't the first cornerback taken, he should be the second behind Miami's Antrell Roll, likely somewhere in the top 15 picks. Dude ended up being pretty on point as Pac-Man was not only the first DB taken, but the first defensive player taken, period, in the 2005 draft when the Titans selected him sixth overall. It's not every day you see a cornerback go that high, but when you also have that kick slash punt return ability, it just raised your value so much, bro. Being picked sixth overall made Pac-Man the highest West Virginia Virginia player ever taken in the NFL draft. Unfortunately, it took very little time for Pac-Man to rack up his first arrest. Pac-Man was arrested for assault and felony vandalism of a nightclub. The charges were dropped the following year, but throughout his career, you're gonna see in a second, he just always managed to find himself in these situations. Due to this, that incident we talked about in college and several other rumors, the Titans really didn't trust Pac-Man. He ended up having a hold out for most of training camp trying to get his contract situation straight. He basically ended up signing a contract that stipulated if he was convicted for a crime that he would not get any of his guaranteed money or any of his bonus money. Pac-Man tried to fight it for a while, but eventually he ended up signing that deal. During his rookie season, Pac-Man had 54 tackles and 10 pass deflections. On special teams, he totaled 1,399 return yards and one touchdown. Pac-Man and Ronaldo Hill were the only rookie cornerback duo to start at least 10 games each in the NFL. Pac-Man was always a beast on the field and super talented, but his issue was he could never stay on the field. The ghost of his past always seemed to run him down and corner him. Let's run down a few cases. Right after Pac-Man's rookie season, he was arrested again. He was charged with possession of marijuana and handcuffed after throwing a punch at an officer. That got him an additional felony count of obstruction. August 25th, 2006, he was arrested again in Tennessee for disorderly conduct and public intoxication, both misdemeanors. He was accused of assault by Toya Garth, who says that Pac-Man spit in her face and she spit back. The judge gave him a sentence of six months probation, provided he stayed out of further trouble. October 26, 2006, Pac-Man is cited for misdemeanor assault at Club Mystic, a Nashville nightclub, where he allegedly spits in the face of another chick, this time a college student. For this one, Pac-Man was suspended for one game by the Titans. Despite his off the field transgressions, Pac-Man was still balling on the field and in his second season, he totaled a career high 62 tackles, one sack, one forced fumble, 12 deflected passes, four interceptions, 130 return yards on those interceptions, 
and one interception return for a touchdown. He was also tied for an NFL high with three punt return touchdowns. That tied a franchise record with Billy White Shoes Johnson. Then to add to all of that, his 12.9 yards per punt return also led the NFL just edging out Devin Hester by one tenth of a damn yard. So one of the best years of Pac-Man's career. How does he follow up one of the best years of his career? with one of the worst off seasons of his career. Cue the suspense music. February 19th, 2007, a melee breaks out involving Pac-Man Jones after he decides to make it rain inside a gentleman's club in Las Vegas. Minutes after the fight, an unknown gunman, of course, decides to shoot three people by the front entrance. Terrible, terrible situation, man, and the rest of it plays out kinda like a movie. This is what one of the witnesses had to say. So according to the witness, Pac-Man was sitting in VIP with seven acquaintances, six chicks and a bodyguard. He's drinking a little bit, got some Patron, got some Don Perignon, and Pac-Man's sitting there having a good time and he's watching Nelly, who oddly keeps popping up in these videos, but he's watching Nelly and JD, they out there, they throwing money, you know, they at the strip club. So Pac-Man's like, bet. He take $3,500, convert it to ones, he goes out, start mm, throwing that up on the stage. Now, to this point, this just sounds like a fun night at the strip club and some really good patronage. That's all it sounds like to me right now. But shortly after that, the melee breaks out and then, of course, the gunshots. In the aftermath, the security guard at the club, a former WWF wrestler named Tommy Urbanski, was on the ground with his spinal cord shattered by a bullet. Then on top of that, two other people, uh, another bouncer and a female patron were also shot. The club's owner, Robert Sussner, blamed the entire melee on Pac-Man. He said that Pac-Man knew the shooter and had threatened to kill one of the bouncers. This is what the owner of the club said. Now check it out. He wasn't even there at the time, but he did go back and interview employees and he reviewed the footage and that's the story that he came out with. Now, Pac-Man didn't end up getting charged in this situation. Um, I will note that he did hire the same lawyer that Ray Lewis hired during his stabbing case back in the year 2000. Shortly after the incident, Roger Goodell came down pretty hard on Pac-Man, understandably so. While they was waiting on the charges, Roger Goodell went ahead and suspended Pac-Man for the entire season. And in a written statement, Roger Goodell told Pac-Man Jones, I must emphasize to you that this is your last opportunity to salvage your career. So at that point, Pac-Man had come so far, but again, still running from these ghosts chasing pellets, he was about to blow it all. If he didn't figure out a way to straighten it all out soon. During his suspension, Pac-Man said that he would take responsibilities for his actions. And he decided that in the meantime, he would try out wrestling, which is kind of a weird decision, just based on the fact that the guy who got shot in the spine was an ex-wrestler, just, you know what I'm saying? It's just kind of weird, but whatever. He did go and do that. He wrestled at TNA, and he ended up winning the tag team championship in wrestling, man. He also started a record label during that time called National Street League Records, and he performed as one half of the rap group Poster Boy. Pac-Man said that being suspended from the NFL was one of the worst moments of his life. He started hearing rumors about him being traded from the Titans, and he was like, well, if they're gonna trade me, I'd prefer to go to the Cowboys. I guess closed mouths don't get fed because lo and behold, he got traded to the Cowboys. Due to an agreement between Pac-Man and the Titans, he had to dish out 500 racks to a charity of the Titans choosing, and they got a fourth and a sixth round pick for him. Pac-Man was reinstated right before the season started, signed a four-year deal with the Cowboys with no guarantees, and that was that. The Cowboys tried to be proactive, and they basically hit Pac-Man with the whole Des Bryant treatment. They assigned him a bodyguard to keep him out of trouble. That didn't work. October 7, 2008, Pac-Man was involved in an alcohol-related incident in downtown Dallas. Him along with the bodyguard that was assigned to keep him out of trouble. So the way it ended up working out, it was almost like they assigned Pac-Man to get this dude in trouble. You know what I'm saying? That's how it worked out. After that happened, given Pac-Man's history and the stern warning that he did get from Goodell, he was suspended from the league indefinitely. That indefinite suspension ended up basically just being six game suspension and like some alcohol rehabilitation stuff. And by December, Pac-Man was back with the Cowboys. Unfortunately, this really hurt the Titans probably more than anybody because due to the nature of whatever the trade details were, 
Once Pac-Man got in trouble, the Titans had to give the Cowboys a fifth round pick and they had to return the Cowboys sixth round pick that they had gotten. Yeah, that's rough. I ain't gonna lie. On January 7, 2009, the Cowboys announced that they would release Pac-Man Jones. According to reports, this move came after Cowboys officials learned that Pac-Man was a suspect in the June 2007 shooting outside a strip club in Atlanta. Pac-Man in these strip clubs is trouble, bro every time is trouble and this whole situation sounded hella similar to the last situation as they alleged that pac-man had ordered the shooting that took place at the club now whether he did or he didn't it's just the fact that he kept finding himself in these spots that start to make him just look guilty by association. So the way that whole saga ends, Pac-Man couldn't even last a full year with the Cowboys. It was too much drama, even for Jerry Jones. In 2009, Pac-Man agreed to a contract in principle with the CFL, but they retracted the offer when Pac-Man made what they perceived as disparaging comments when he was basically accidentally confusing the CFL with the UFL. The UFL was a startup league at the time, so because Pac-Man basically lost the CFL deal, for confusing them with the UFL, the UFL reached out and offered him a contract that Pac-Man quickly declined. Now, once again, he was out of football and looking for a new home. In 2010, Pac-Man held the workout. Six NFL teams came and five years after he was drafted, Pac-Man Jones ran a 4-4-2 in the 40-yard dash. Still hella impressive athletically and he had calmed down a bit. He seemed like he was ready to try to get to a new chapter in his life. And if no team wanted to give him a shot, y'all know there's always one that will my Cincinnati Bengals. On May 10, 2010, Pac-Man signed a two-year deal with the Bengals. He went through the offseason and the preseason without incident, amazingly, and made it to the regular season roster. Unfortunately, the first couple of years he was with the Bengals, he sustained a bad neck injury, then he had a hamstring injury, and he barely was even on the field. Still, after those years was up, we decided to re-sign Pac-Man and give it yet another shot. This honestly paid off for everybody. Say what you wanna say about Pac-Man and say what you wanna say about the Bengals, but they were able to partner up and turn what had been a, just a tumultuous career that looked like it was gonna end prematurely and turn it into something that was really a good partnership. Pac-Man really settled into Cincy and had a solid second half of his career. Situations like this is partly responsible for the love-hate relationship that a lot of Bengals fans had with Marvin Lewis. Marvin Lewis was a really good human, really good dude, and he was a father figure to a lot of these cats. Pac-Man Jones was one of those people. You gotta remember, Pac-Man had lost the major male figures in his life way back when he was five years old. So to have Marvin Lewis come in and become that for you, that's a huge deal, man. And Pac-Man is quoted saying that Marvin Lewis saved his life, like literally saved his life. He helped get him back on track. So, you know, shout out to Marv for that, man. That's what's up. You can see the growth in Pac-Man as he got married in 2014 and went on to have three kids with his wife. A really beautiful thing to see because we know what happened to his family when he was growing up. So to see him build his own family, you know, years later, that's just that's just dope bro now that same year 2014 pac-man jones made first team all pro for the first time in his career pretty amazing that a cornerback can make first team all pro during the ninth year of his career for the first time at that that's pretty crazy and that really show you the potential that he had like if he really could have just gotten it right during those other eight years, those first eight years of his career, when he was even more athletic and even more dynamic. During Pac-Man's seven years in Cincinnati, he helped us make the playoffs five times. But I do gotta point out the one time that he and Vontez kinda costed us our first playoff win in ages. Most of y'all know the story. Pac-Man and Vontez Burford got back-to-back -back penalties. I've talked about this several times before, so I'm not gonna harp on it long, but we were up. It was the fourth quarter. Game was almost over. Ben Roethlisberger was injured, couldn't throw very far at the time, had a busted shoulder, and things were looking really good for us. Then Pac-Man kind of lost it, then Vontez kind of lost it, and the Bengals lost it. The game, I mean. The thing that always pissed me off about that situation is that Joey Porter was a coach 
at the time. This dude was all on the field creating problems, bro. He basically baited Pac-Man in, which we all know Pac-Man got a temper, so it wasn't that hard to do. And he helped create that entire situation. So I do kind of feel the way, but look, you know, it is what it is. And we all know what happened after that. Montez hit AB, we lost. AB went to the Raiders, left 30 mil on the table, almost followed a YouTuber, dropped a rap track, and here we are today. In 2018, the Bengals did not re-sign Pac-Man Jones, making him a free agent. He ended up making headlines one more time for a situation at the airport. Basically, Pac-Man get off the plane and an airport employee, bro, an employee starts an altercation with Pac-Man and then loses. He start the whole thing and then he lost. Kind of like Mason Rudolph, actually. Except this time, the authorities actually got the situation right. Pac-Man, who clearly won the fight very easily, it seems, jet lag and all, <laughs> was able to piece dude up in self-defense and then the police came and arrested the dude that assaulted him. I ain't gonna lie, I couldn't believe they got the situation right just because based on Pac-Man's past, I just knew the police was gonna at least arrest him and then, you know, make a big scene and then figure out everything else later. But they didn't. They actually showed up, found out what happened, got it right, and kept moving. Pac-Man would have a brief stint with the Broncos in 2018, but after only seven games, he would be released. And finally, May 24, 2019, nearly 15 years after being drafted, Pac-Man Jones announced his retirement. Finally, walking away from the Pac-Man moniker. He could finally shut off the game and stop running from the ghost of his past. All thanks to the fact that he had spent the last few years of his career building a brighter future. Today, Pac-Man Jones has only been out of the game for about a year. He's been doing well, seems to have a few business ventures going, doing a little bit of coaching on the side, you know, giving back. And most importantly, he's been spending lots of time with his family and enjoying his retirement. He definitely didn't take the conventional path and he started out with more disadvantages than the vast majority of successful people. But ultimately, he still found success and more importantly, the dude found happiness and that's what's up that's what it's all about hope y'all enjoyed the video that's what happened to pac-man jones my name is flim low raps i'm out at you next time fellas one yeah,